each. Let's go ahead and open a word of prayer and get started. We're a little bit late. Let's pray. Father, we want to thank you for this evening. God, for this opportunity to gather again to study your word, to study the life of Jesus. Father, from a Jewish perspective, and so we pray, God, that you would open our eyes of understanding. Lord, that we would perceive, God, the things that we're going to study in your word. And Lord, we'd be transformed by it. God, help us to love your son, Jesus, and be transformed into his likeness. We commit this meeting to you, your Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, amen. All righty. We are on paragraph 22, which is on page 18. All right, we are looking at John the Baptist. And uh, let's see, 3, 7 through 10. All right, I will read the text, Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 through 10. But when he saw many, this is John the Baptist, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said unto them, You offspring of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit worthy of repentance, and think not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And even now the axe lies at the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that brings not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. All right. So John is baptizing, and now the Pharisees and Sadducees have come out to observe. Can anyone remember? This is actually what we're going to talk about, but can anyone remember why the Pharisees and the Sadducees have come out to examine John's ministry? Because people were saying he was the Messiah. There you go. They have a, a messianic claim. They've got to come out and investigate that claim now. So that's where we pick up here. Uh, here we begin to examine a significant Jewish contextual action which gives clarity to what John and later Jesus will undergo. In the Jewish, Jewish religious landscape of the day, when a movement appeared which had messianic overtones, the Sanhedrin, the Sanhedrin was a gathering... A, the word means sitting together, the Sanhedrin, which, by the way, the Sanhedrin has been reconstituted by the folks putting together the temple. They are prepared. They've got all the artifacts. The Sanhedrin is in place. If I'm not mistaken, they even have identified the high priest, and they're just waiting to build. They've had the red red heifer for quite a spell the now. The cow's pretty big now. Uh, or they cloned it. Maybe they've cloned it. Well, actually, they had several of them. They had several of them. And I mean, they had trouble getting it right at first, but then they did, and it seemed like after that, they just got a whole bunch of farmers all over. Yeah. Well, there, it's a 71-member body. There were 24 chief priests who were Sadducees, 24 elders who were Pharisees, 22 scribes who were Pharisees, and then the high priest was a Sadducee. So it's a total of 71 members, and now they've sent representatives to observe this ministry of John's. Uh, the Sanhedrin would launch an investigation consisting of two stages. A de delegation would be sent out from Jerusalem to determine whether the movement was significant or not. If it was significant, then stage two would begin. So the first stage is the observation stage. They would only observe what was being said, taught, and done. They were to ask no questions yet. They were to raise no objections yet. They were not to verbalize, only to watch. If the movement was insignificant, then the matter would be dropped. The second phase, if it was significant, then stage two would begin. This is the stage of interrogation. So again, there's the observation stage where they're just quiet, they're observing, they're taking notes, they're gonna go back and report to the Sanhedrin. Now they're in, the second stage would be entered where they begin to interrogate. And that's where we're going to see a lot of the conflict between Jesus and the Pharisees uh, when they begin to examine his ministry from the observation phase to the interrogation phase. And then they become critical of what he's doing. Uh, in the interrogation phase, uh, another delegation would then be sent out to ask questions. The second delegation was allowed to raise objections 
They would look for a basis to accept or reject the movement. The Pharisees and Sadducees that John addressed in Matthew 3, 7 are the vanguard are the vanguard of observers sent out to investigate phase one of the investigation. They are not coming out to be baptized by John. If they had come in repentance, then John would not be calling them vipers. Luke 7, chapter 7, verse 30 says, But the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. Now remember, and I may touch on this again, in the text it says, uh, uh, Bring forth fruit, therefore, worthy of repentance. Notice what he says, and remember, repentance means to change your mind. Okay, now notice this as he's rebuking the Pharisees. Bring forth, therefore, fruit worthy of repentance. And think not to say within yourselves... So here he's challenging them to change their mind. Do not think within yourselves, Oh, we have Abraham as our father. And we're going to find out a little bit later that the, the basic teaching of the Pharisees was, if you were a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you had a place in the kingdom. So... So this is why John is rebuking them. He says that's not the case. And he, he says uh, God can raise up sons of Abraham uh, from the stones, from the very rocks. So, all right, so here we go. Uh, Fruchtenbaum says what happens to the herald will happen to the king. So as we see this, this observation phase and the interrogation phase, and of course later we see the rejection of John's ministry, his execution, and so it's going to happen to the king. This is a theme we'll see played out on several levels. Jesus will also be investigated in like manner. We will see this process unfold later in our study, particularly in relation to Jesus. In Matthew 3, 9, John addresses a false idea, here we go, that was commonly taught in Judaism, that merely being a descendant of Abraham would save them, and that all ethnic Jews would enter into the Messianic kingdom. John is warning them not to believe this. We'll see this fallacy addressed not only by John, but later by Jesus as well. John continues to address the people with some radical concepts of living, as we see from the Luke passage. Those who are being baptized by John want to know how they should now live in keeping with true repentance. John teaches the people not to live according to what society expected. So in other words, I mean, it's the same old concept in the New Testament, that we're not to be conformed or squeezed into the mold of this world. So John is telling them, don't live according to what society expects out of you uh, and your roles in life, but in terms of what God has expected. He urges the people, so this is your garden variety people that have gathered, not to hoard or to be greedy and to share with the poor. They're to be generous instead of miserly. He addresses the tax collectors and tells them not to steal from the people but to be honest. This is a radical concept for publicans or tax collectors because it was status quo for them to skim a hefty profit off the taxes they were collecting. So remember that the tax collectors were despised because Rome would demand five shekels and the tax collector and the publican would say, pay ten. And then he would pocket five and then send five to Rome. And, and, and they were Jewish. They were Jewish tax collectors, and so they were despised. And there was a law made that you could not, you could not have fellowship. You could not meet with the tax collector. It was forbidden for the average person to talk to Is that to them. the way they were paid? Well, they received a small stipend from the state, but, but it wasn't anything impressive. So they would pad their earnings by forcing them to pay this outrageously high tax. Well, evidently that was okay with the state. Oh, yeah, the Romans didn't care as long as they got their five well, shekels. But, so the Pharisees and the Sadducees, one of them believed in the resurrection, the other ones didn't? Yeah, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection, the Sadducees did not. The Sadducees were primarily in charge of running the temple. And the Pharisees were, were they were more strict uh, uh, more strict in adhering to the to the commandments to the to the text, they accepted the whole Old Testament, whereas the Sadducees only accepted, I believe, was the Torah, just the first five books, or the excuse me, the I always get it Torah and Tanakh and 
but anyway, the Pentateuch, the first five books of Moses, is all they accept. They didn't accept the uh, prophets. Um, okay, uh, so we did the tax collectors, did that. He tells the soldiers, now this was interesting too. Uh, Dr. Fruchtenbaum says the soldiers were Jewish soldiers. These are not Gentiles who come out to be baptized. These were Jewish soldiers that did the same thing. They would, they would work for Rome, they would be employed, and they would use violence to steal from the people. So again, if you ever watch Schindler's List, and you see the Jews you know, with the Star of David, and they're helping the Nazis round up their brethren and put them into the ovens, that's kind of what we're talking about back at that time. Soldiers would use their position to gain power and wealth, and John was instructing them how to function righteously in their profession. All right. All right, now Matthew chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. Page 20. John continues, he says, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, but he that comes after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I am not worthy to bear. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse his threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner, but the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. All right, John is baptizing with water, but John points out that the one who comes after him will baptize in two ways. And so, by the way, every human being, every human being will be baptized by Jesus Christ. Number one, those who believe will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Number two, those who do not believe will be baptized by fire. So, anyway, I'll, we'll get into this in, in a sec here. Okay, there's your two baptisms. Fire is for the chaff. Now, if, when we get further along into Matthew chapter 13, it, uh, he gives the parable of the wheat and the chaff that a, an enemy has come and sown, t actually tares into the wheat and they grow up together and they're separated out, and the tares are, are thrown into the fire, and the wheat is brought in to the kingdom or to the barn. And we see the similar teaching here. The fire uh, is for the chaff, those who do not believe. The fire speaks of the lake of fire, uh, which is the eternal place of the unbeliever who dies in their sins. Anyone who dies in their sins will be cast into the lake of fire. That will be their eternal abode. The Holy Spirit... Baptism of the Holy Spirit is for the wheat, those who believe, and the barn is the kingdom of God. Now remember, the kingdom of God, the Messianic kingdom, because the Jews rejected Jesus, the Messianic kingdom is still yet to come. That's what we call the millennial kingdom, spoken of in Revelation chapter 20. Matthew 3.12, John calls the fire unquenchable fire, which refers to the fire of hell, the lake of fire. Those who believe will be gathered into the barn, which represents the kingdom of God. There is no middle ground. There is no purgatory. Everyone will be baptized by one or the other. Now let's look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. I will flip over there. Hebrews 9, 27 says... And as it is appointed unto men once to die... But after this, the judgment. Okay. The Luke passage tells us that John preached the good news of the coming of the Messiah with many other exhortations. Both the Matthew and Luke passages sum up John's message and his warning to the people of Israel. Wait, you're, you got the NIV there? No, I just read that out of King James. Which, uh... Hebrews 9.27. I just wanted to hear what it said there about, uh, about Matthew 12, 3.12. 12. Uh, that's how the ASV, I'm reading out the book, Fruchtenbaum's uh, Harmony, and that's the ASV version, version. Verse 12 says, Whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly cleanse the threshing floor. He will gather his wheat into the garner. But the chaff he will burn up with unquenchable fire. That doesn't sound right to me. Huh? How about his winnowing fork is in his hand? They will clear his threshing floor. 
gathering the wheat into the barn, burning up the chaff. Yeah, and I don't know. I'd have to look at the, the Greek on that. Um, again, this is this is, uh, has a different family of Greek text that the ASV comes from. Either way, the fan is what he will. I, I think in terms of the Holy Spirit, uh, the Spirit of God is going to uh, he's going to baptize the believer, but he will be the wind that fans the flame that burns the chaff. So, anyway. Or is that the King James, what you have there, Bill? Yeah. Okay. Matthew three thirteen through 17. Then came Yeshua from Galil to the Yarden, <laughs> Yarden is the Jordan River, unto Yohanan to be baptized of him. But Yohanan would have hindered him, saying, I have need to be baptized of you, and you come to me? But Yeshua answering said unto him, Suffer it for now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Yeshua, when he was baptized, went up immediately, or straightway, from the water. And lo, the heavens were opened unto him. And he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and coming upon him. And lo, a voice out of heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Okay. The baptism of, of Jesus marks his last act of his private life and the first act of his public life. Let's discuss what baptism means in Judaism. Over the centuries, the church at large has lost touch with the Jewish meaning of the act of baptism. Alright, there are some key words here in Hebrew and then in Greek uh, that help us understand baptism. The first word is mikvah. It's the place of immersion. This is in the Hebrew. The mikvah was a place of immersion, and when we went to, uh, when I was in Israel, we were on the south end of the temple, outside the temple uh, mount, they had discovered the mikvahs, where the Jews would come before they bring their sacrifice, and they would bathe, they would dip and immerse themselves in these mikvahs, and then they would go up to the temple mount and offer their sacrifice. So the mikvah was the place of immersion, the to Let's see, how did you pronounce that? Tevila, the tevila, is a Hebrew word for immersion. In Jewish life, there is only total immersion. There is no sprinkling, pouring, or any other form of water ritual. Now as we go to the Greek, which makes up the New Testament, you have the word bapto, means to dip or to dye. It is associated with the idea of changing color and changing identification. And the key word is baptizo, and it's the, the same word, it's a synonym in the Greek for the Hebrew, tevila, and it means to immerse. Uh, baptizo means to immerse. This is the direct translation of tevila, of tevila. From this we get the term baptism. And what they did in the translation is they, they didn't, to keep the peace, when they translated the word for baptism, Baptizo is the Greek, and the English is baptism. So they didn't translate it, they transliterated it. In other words, if they had translated the word baptizo in our Bible, it would say, and he was immersed. But instead, the scripture says, was baptized, so that the average you know, yokel doesn't realize that sprinkling is not baptism. So anyway, so they transliterated it. They took the, the Greek word and... and polished it up and made it English instead of actually translating the word itself to give us the meaning of baptizo. Mm. Uh, so anyway, it's very clear, and Fruchtenbaum points this out, that the Jews never did any sprinkling or pouring. It was always immersion, and so it carries over into the New Testament. And the Greek word testifies to that, meaning to immerse. The meaning of the word is immersion. The meaning of the act is identification. To be baptized meant to identify oneself with a message, person, or group. Look at Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. So let me read that. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 through 17. 
For it hath, been it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. This is the right text, correct? Now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus, Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of none effect. So what was going on in Corinth was whoever baptized them, they were saying, oh, I'm, I'm of this crowd. And they would associate themselves with the person who actually did the, the baptism itself, instead of identifying with Christ, which is a picture of, of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You're identifying with that when you go through the act of baptism. Okay. To, okay, did that one. The Corinthians were erring in that they were identifying themselves with those who baptized them rather than with Christ's person, messenger group. Baptism meant, not only, uh, meant that not only was one identifying with a new group, but also that one was breaking away from the old group. To this day when a Gentile converts to Judaism, it means that he is breaking away from his old identification and identifying with Judaism. Those who were baptized by John were committing to accept the one that John would point out as being the Messiah. They were identifying with that message. We will see later that those who were baptized by John did indeed accept Jesus as the Messiah. Believer's baptism, so that's us today, believer's baptism means that one is identifying oneself with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Those who were baptized by John would later be baptized as believers in Jesus. And we see that in the book of Acts. Remember when... Um, uh, 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 what was his name? He was <laughs> charismatic, uh, but he only knew the baptism of John. Oh my goodness, I can't believe I can't oh, believe this. Um, the guy that uh, pursued and then went to and corrected. Yeah, and they she they corrected his teaching. But anyway, the people that he baptized were baptized again because. The baptism of John had been fulfilled in Jesus Christ, and now they need to be baptized, identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. It's going to come to my mind, and I'll blurt it out when it does. In the meantime, who it means? Um, John, okay. All right, we'll look at some extra comments on baptism in a few minutes. All right, six reasons for the baptism of Jesus. Four of the reasons come out of the context of the passage and two from other passages. Number one, to fulfill all righteousness. Jesus was baptized to fulfill all righteousness. And what that means is that Jesus has fulfilled the Mosaic law. Now remember, John was saying, I, I shouldn't be baptizing you, you should be baptizing me. And Jesus uh, said, no, I need to be baptized for this reason. And it was to to fulfill all righteousness. And Jesus fulfilled the Mosaic Law. He is the only one to ever do so in complete perfection and is identifying with the fulfillment of the law. The righteousness Jesus is referring to is that of the Mosaic Law. He came to fulfill the law. And so we know that sin, the essence of sin, is the transgression of the law. We know from Romans 3.20 that God gave the law not to make us righteous, but as an x-ray. If we read Romans 3.20, uh, Therefore by the, by the deeds of the law there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the law is given to reveal sin, that we break the law. 
Jesus, being God himself, kept the law perfectly because, well, he's the author of it. And so now he's baptized to identify himself as the one fulfilling the Mosaic law. Jesus is referring, uh, yes, we read that one. Jesus is identified with the kingdom message that John is preaching. That is, that the kingdom of God has come. And of course it has come because he's the king. And if the Jews had received him, he would have established the Messianic kingdom. And again, I don't understand how all that would have worked. I was thinking about it the other day and I thought, you know what, if the Jews had received him as their king, it may have been like at, at, at the Messianic kingdom that's coming in the future. There would be this great rebellion and maybe at that point he would be crucified at that point, raised. Sorry? Thank you, Apollos. Very good. That's it. That's it. The one. Apollos. Um, okay. Point number three. Jesus identifying with the believing remnant that John is preparing for the kingdom of God. So he defines the term remnant. Let's see. We're still on 51. Yes. Uh, the remnant that John is preparing is used to define the smaller portion of Israel which believes as opposed to the larger portion who does not. And you see this illustration in this circle. So the circle represents all the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. All right? The remnant, or the smaller portion, is that group of Jews who believe the message of Christ. And they're righteous by faith. Okay. Throughout the Old Testament, there was always a larger number of Israelis, Israelites who did not follow the Scriptures and a smaller group that did believe in the Scriptures. The majority of Israel were idolaters and followed the occult practices of their neighbors. That is why God judged them and they were carried away in captivity. The northern kingdom was taken to Assyria. The southern kingdom was taken into Babylon by Nebuchadnezzar because the overwhelming majority of the Israelites were in rebellion against God and idolaters. In Elijah's day, there was a pretty small remnant. Okay, we won't look at 1 Kings, but 1 Kings 19, verses 14 and 18, uh, there were only 7,000 who had not followed other gods. And I ran the math today. If there was 7,000, if there were only 7,000 Israelites who believed in Messiah today, they have an 8.5 million population in Israel, and that would be less than 1% of the remnant if it were 7,000 today. Now, obviously, we don't know what that number is. And we only know 7,000 at the time of Elijah because Elijah was, you know, kind of pouting and complaining to God that there was he was the only one left, and they're going to kill him. He said, you're not the only one. I've reserved 7,000, not about the need to be. But that is the remnant. Here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, the remnant was comprised of those who accepted John's message and who were being prepared to accept Jesus as Messiah. Okay, his fourth reason uh, for baptism is to be made publicly known to Israel. Now we're going to see how that's fulfilled in just a second. The fifth reason was to be identified with the sinner. Let me read 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. Speaking of Christ, Paul writes, he says, For he, the Father, hath made him, the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he is being identified with sinners, and finally, to receive his anointing by the Holy Spirit. Let's go back to the fourth reason. Luke's uh, account makes mention that the Holy Spirit came down in bodily form. Not a ghostly spirit form, but a bodily form. But why in the form of a dove? In Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the Hebrew word for moving uh, is used of the Spirit of God was moving over the face of the water. The word in Hebrew means brooded. All right? And, oh, that was the six reasons. I just skipped that one. All right? And um, the word in Hebrew, in the, in the Hebrew Old Testament, is merahephet. 
Merahethet is a word that's used in Genesis chapter 1, verse 2, the brooding portion. A word used of a mother bird brooding over a nest of eggs before they hatch. The rabbis of that day in the Midrashim, which was a collection of rabbinic writings, if I'm not mistaken, the Mid Midrashim was the, the commentary on the Old Testament, the Jewish commentary on the Old Testament. They had identified the word merechephet with a dove, not just any bird. Look at Matthew 3.16. After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting on him. The Son and the Spirit are present in both in bodily form. The Father is present in the voice coming down from heaven in Matthew 3.17 when he says, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. We see here the Trinity of God in this passage. Now for the bat kol. The bat kol means, quote, the daughter of a voice, unquote. It refers to God's voice from heaven. It was a Jewish technical term for when God spoke out of heaven. Between the time of Malachi and John the Baptist, there was a period of silence from the prophets. Now they hear God's voice again and hear in the form of what they termed a bat coal. This occurs again later in Jesus' ministry. So the elements present at Jesus' baptism, God's voice and the form of a dove, were in keeping with rabbinic, rabbinic concepts of the time. God's voice announced that Jesus was the Messiah, and he was anointed by the Holy Ghost for service. We flip over to Psalm chapter 2, verse 7. Psalm 2, verse 7. Uh, the scripture says, I will declare the decree. The Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So this is referring to the bat kol, the voice from heaven. And so this was prophesied in Psalm chapter 2. And by the way, as we approach Easter, if you go to Psalm 22, you read Psalm 22, and, um, um, boy, I'm drawing a blank tonight. Big time. Apollos, okay, and Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Uh, he describes Psalm 22 as an x-ray of the cross. So when you overlay Psalm 22 over Jesus' suffering on the cross, you see what the suffering of his interior man was. Whereas Isaiah 53 is kind of an exterior view of the suffering and torture that Jesus endured on our behalf. Okay. Uh... Luke's account says that Jesus was around 30 years old at this time. Uh, I think if we did the math, we determined that he was about 34 years old. In the next paragraph, Jesus, who came to fulfill all righteousness, will have his righteousness tested in the wilderness by Satan. Okay, a few points on baptism. Um, you know what? He goes into sacrament versus ordinance. Uh, the term sacrament means a ritual, the practice of a ritual where grace is somehow efficiently conveyed to the partaker. That's the, the, the sacrament uh, perspective of baptism. Uh, let's see. In Roman Catholicism, grace that is conveyed through the sacrament has saving value. Okay, so we see that there's error in this concept of the sacrament. Um, with the Reformation, other ideas concerning the expression of sacraments were formulated. The Reformed definition of a sacrament is, quote, a sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ in which, by sensible signs, the grace of God in Christ and the benefits of the covenant of grace are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. And these, in turn, give expression to their faith and allegiance to God. So you have a very subtle uh, shift when you describe the baptism as a sacrament because they're saying it's necessary to perform this quote-unquote sacrament or this act in order for grace to be applied to your account. 
And we know that grace, the very essence of grace is, it's not of works. Grace is a gift. God's riches at Christ's expense. So therefore, the concept of the sacrament is in error as it relates to baptism and as it relates to the Lord's Supper, which the Reformers view the Lord's Supper as a sacrament whereby grace is given to the participant, partaker. So in other words, you've got to do a work, take the piece of bread and eat it, in order to receive a portion of grace. And so that's a big error in the concept of a sacrament. An ordinance can be, however, an ordinance can be defined as a rite or ritual or practice prescribed by the Messiah to be performed by the church. This is the difference. As an outward sign of the saving truth of the Christian faith. Rather than seeing the ordinances as conveying grace, it is better to see them as visible signs of saving truth. And that is why the term ordinance is better than the term sacrament. And I know when we attended Baptist churches, it was, an or, it was called an ordinance, the ordinance of baptism and the Lord's Supper. Fruit to Mom goes on and says, There is a better definition, and that is more in keeping with the Jewish origins of baptism. Baptism is an identification or association with a person or message or group. And of course, as the body of Christ, when we believe the gospel, the person we're identifying with in baptism is Jesus. The message is the gospel, which uh, 1 Corinthians 15, verses 1 through 4, we see that the gospel message is the Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. He was buried, and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. So that is the message that we're identifying with, and the group that we identify with is, of course, the body of Christ or the church. Okay, uh, the remnant. I'm not going to, I won't go into uh, details about the Jewish remnant. I will say this, though, about it. After reading this, I recognize that I hear Christians use that term loosely to describe the remnant as the body of Christ. But Fruchtenbaum teaches the concept that the word remnant is exclusively applied to redeemed Jews. Those sons of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ and are saved. So anyway, that sticks out in my mind now every time I hear it. Jan Markell says that a lot for uh, a message for remnant believers. But really the, word, the term applies to the Jews exclusively. Okay, the purposes of temptation. So now, so now to set the stage again, now Jesus has been identified as the Son of God. And remember, the people have gathered around and they're seeing John baptize this one that is the Lamb of God and come up out of the water. They see the Merahephet come. They recognize that is the Holy Spirit landing upon this one now identified as the Son of God and the voice, the bat coal from heaven affirming that Jesus is the Son of God. So you've got the manifestation of the triune God identifying Jesus as the Son of God and now he's going to go into the wilderness, and the devil is going to say, now prove that you're the Son of God. Okay? So we pick up in the temptation in the wilderness, Luke chapter 4, verses 1 through 13, reads as follows. And Yeshua, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Yardin, and was led in the Spirit in the wilderness, during forty days being tempted of the devil. And he did, he did eat nothing in those days. And when they were completed, he hungered. And the devil said unto him, If you are the Son of God, see, listen to his challenge, If you are the Son of God, command this stone that it become bread. And Yeshua answered unto him, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone. And he led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And the devil said unto him, to you will I give all this authority and the glory of them. For it has been delivered unto me, and to whomsoever I will, I give it. If you therefore will worship me, worship before me, it shall be all yours. Yeshua answered and said unto him, It is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. And he led him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple, and said unto him, If you are the Son of God, Cast yourself down from hence, for it is written, 
He shall give his angels charge concerning you to guard you, and on their hands they shall bear you up, lest haply you dash your foot against a stone. And Yeshua answering said unto him, It is said, You shall not make a trial of the Lord your God. And when the devil had completed every temptation, he departed from him for a season. All right. God's purpose in this temptation was to prove the sinlessness of the Son. Satan's purpose was to cause Jesus to sin in order to disqualify him from making the atonement. Now let me just throw this out as a general theological question. If Jesus committed one sin, why would that disqualify him for making the atonement for all mankind? Sinless. Okay, but why? That's true. He had to be sinless. sinless. The answer is, drum roll, because if he had sinned, then he would have to die for his own sin. He would be condemned. Then he could not bear our sin. So it was essential that he not sin. And of course, he's God. He's not going to sin. Praise God. Okay. Uh, Satan did that. Uh, he was also, let's see, while it's often recognized that Jesus was enduring temptation in his representative role as a human, it is not as often recognized that he is also playing a representative role as Israel. Two separate representative roles in his temptation are, number one, first with Israel. This Israelite has not failed, where Israel as a nation failed to keep the Mosaic Covenant. Secondly, secondly, is that right? Yeah, okay. Uh, with all believers to show how he would deal with temptation. So a representative of, of Israel and of the, the believer uh, in general. As his representative role with Israel. Uh, his five correlations with Israel, the nation Israel. There is a correlation, the use of the term Son of God. In Luke 4, verse 3, Satan taunts Jesus, if thou art the Son of God, he says twice. In our previous class, okay, we discussed about how Matthew 3, 15 states that Jesus sojourned in Egypt in fulfillment of the scripture, out of Egypt did I call my son, in Hosea 11, 1, and Exodus 4, 22 and 23. Remember, it was a literal plus typical way to quote the Old Testament scripture. Jesus is a typology of Israel in this verse, as, as he is in the testing in the wilderness. So he's saying, just as Israel was tested in the wilderness for 40 years, now Jesus is tested in the wilderness for 40 days. And he talks about the 40 here in just a second. The testing in the wilderness of Israel correlates to Jesus' testing also occurring in the wilderness. It is clear that the testing of the Israelites is an example to believers in regard to temptation. And you can look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, and read about the, the, the lessons that we can learn from Israel and their temptation in the wilderness. Point number three, the correlation is seen in the number 40. 40 years in the wilderness for Israel, 40 days in the desert for Jesus. There is a correlation in the presence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was present in the desert with Israel. All right, let me look at uh, Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, uh, verses 10 through 14. Okay, Isaiah 63, 10 says... But they, speaking of Israel, rebelled and vexed his Holy Spirit. Therefore he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old, Moses and his people, saying, Where is he that brought them up out of the sea, and with the shepherds, the shepherd of his flock? Where is he that put his Holy Spirit within him, that led them by the right hand of Moses, with his glorious arm, dividing the water before them, to make himself an everlasting name, that led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they should not stumble, 
As a beast goeth down into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord caused him to rest. So didst thou lead thy people to make thyself a glorious name. The Holy Spirit is present in the desert with Israel, and Jesus is led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, as we see in Luke 4, chapter 4, verse 1. When Jesus quotes the Old Testament, all three citations come from the book of, book of Deuteronomy. This book is a book of the law which reiterates the law from the other three books of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. In Greek, deuteros nomos means a repetition of the law. This is where we get the word Deuteronomy, which is not a Hebrew word. Moses rearranges the law into a specific covenant, covenantal order, that of a suzerain-vassal treaty. A suzerain-vassal treaty. Suzerain, anyone? Anyone what a suzerain is? Don't you use that word a lot? <laughs> Write little notes to your spouse? Anyway, maybe not as much as I do, but okay, I had to look it up too. Uh, a suzerain is a sovereign or a state having control over another state that is internally autonomous. That's the suzerain. So he's the sovereign. And the vassal is a person or country in a subordinate position, uh, in a subordinate position underneath another. So this is a Deuteronomy is written in such a form as a suzerain vassal treaty between God and Israel with five or six points. A suzerain treaty would have five or six points. Many such treaties have been discovered in archaeology pertaining to an agreement between a ruler and his vassals. It was a legal document, a binding contract. Deuteronomy is a covenantal arrangement which God has established with Israel. He quotes only, Jesus quotes only from the book of Deuteronomy because he is fulfilling this covenant now being the representative for Israel. The salient point here is that where Israel as a nation failed to keep God's covenantal contract, Jesus did not fail. All right. Now as a representative, his temptation is in a representative role for believers. Jesus suffered temptation in the major ways that we do. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15 says, quote, for we do not have a high priest which cannot be cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Now this is important to read here, or, or to understand this point. This does not mean he was tempted exactly as we are, and we are not tempted in the same way he was. We this this is a funny point. He says. We cannot be tempted to change stones into bread. For us, this would be impossible. He could not be tempted to waste his day watching soap operas or sports as we can. He suffered temptation in the same three areas as humans do. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. We'll finish up this slide and these points and we'll close. 1 John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, verse 16. Okay, John writes, he says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. So we see here the three areas of human temptation. Number one, the lust of the flesh. Jesus was tempted by the lust of the flesh. His temptation was to make bread from stones because at the end of 40 days, he was hungry. And I mean, can you imagine being at the end of 40 days, having eaten nothing, and Satan says, all you got to do is turn the stones into bread. It would be a powerful temptation. So that was the lust of the flesh. The lust of the eyes, his temptation was to rule the... Okay, his temptation was to rule then over the world, all the world, thereby shortcutting God's plan by Satan's means and not going by the path of the cross. So that was the lust of the eyes. Remember Satan uh, showed him all the kingdoms of the world that 
Satan is the god of this world. The Bible reveals he is the god of this world. So when someone, remember, when someone goes to bow at, 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 some, at the monkey god altar in India, wherever, you know, whatever they've got, when they're bowing to that idol, they are actually worshiping Satan through that idol. And so when someone goes, when, when a Muslim goes and walks around the Kaaba stone and kisses a stone, they're actually worshiping Satan, although both of them, the two individual worshipers would say, oh no, we don't worship Satan. But we know in fact that they are worshiping him through their idolatry. So God's plan, by Satan's means, he was offered, attempted to take the kingdoms of the world right then. And remember, all he had to do was bow down and worship Satan. That ain't happening. And that's through the lust of the eyes, as he saw the kingdoms that were offered to him. And finally, the pride of life. His temptation was to jump off the temple, thereby justifying his deity and proving he was the Messiah. So he resisted the temptation of the pride of life. Luke tells us that when Jesus' temptation was over, Satan departed for a time. We learn that the proper way to deal with temptation from, from Jesus' temptation are as follows. Number one, use God's word. So every time Satan challenged Jesus, he answered and said, it is written. It is written. And boy, if we don't know the word of God, we are susceptible to every lie of the devil. Um, number two, resist the enemy. Unfortunately, victory is temporary because notice it said that he departed, the devil departed from him, Jesus, for a season. Knowing scripture is crucial to having the equipment to resist temptation and spiritual warfare is a lifelong battle. There will never come a point in our lives, this side of eternity, where we say, okay, great, I'm done with spiritual warfare. I don't have to deal with it anymore. I mean, it's funny. You talk to these old wise believers, you know, and they're still struggling with the same things that they struggled with when they were 20 years old, 30 years old, 40 years old. So, notice that Jesus, this is key, Jesus does not do many of the things that you see on TVN or Christian television. The crazy hocus pocus taking their coat off and swinging a coat, coming up, you know, come out of him, devil! You know, this crazy theatrical nonsense that people, I mean, it's stimulating, it's good entertainment, but it has absolutely no power over Satan. But our flesh, you see, our flesh craves that stuff instead of the meat and potatoes of truth. Our flesh wants a show. And so these charlatans are able to go on TV and make merchandise of the body of Christ. People write their check in. I'll never forget. I've shared this story before. Peter Popoff. Peter Popoff. I was a young believer and Peter Popoff came up. Your name is John. John, stand up in the name of Jesus. Oh, and he stood up and everyone, oh, and the tears are flowing out of my eyes as I saw this miracle. How did he know that guy's name? He just went up to him. Well, then you come to find out a few years later, he got a little, little earpiece in his ear. And the wife would go, and if someone came in on crutches, they'd take the crutches and put them in a wheelchair. And she would direct him through a radio, an earpiece in his ear, to go up to John, aisle three, he's the guy in the wheelchair, told him exactly what was wrong, and then he would make the miracle happen. This guy was a total deceiver, but the thing was, it appealed to the eyes. And this guy's a charlatan, and so people are writing checks, and boy, this is a miracle, man. We see a lot of this on Christian TV, and particularly TV and the Trinity Broadcasting Network, with the home of charlatans. Okay, uh, relevant verses to write down for spiritual warfare. Uh, James chapter 4, verse 7. Jude chapter 1, verse 9. And Ephesians, this is the big one, Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 17. Uh, good stuff. Let's see, is there... Okay, I don't see a manuscript on there for this, but he's got some really good uh, teachings on demonism, spiritual warfare, that sort of thing. If you go to ariel.org and just look at you know, the PDFs. The PDFs are awesome because they're only three bucks and you can download it right to your computer. It's good stuff. And again, again if you go to the... Has, it, has anyone gone to the Come and See? The Come and See link on his page to look at those manuscripts? Because those are the $3 ones. Those are, that's a whole bunch of the $3 ones in there free. You can download them for free. 
So, anyway, let's close in prayer. These are three dollar ones, but they're free. Yeah, they're free, and they're they're the ones. They're the PDF teachings that are all related to this teaching series. So there's a whole slew of them. In fact, I think they have the Daniel 70th week on there. The teaching on Daniel 70th week. So. so it wasn't like what you're talking about the other day. What's that? Sunday at church. It's free. Buy one, get one. No, it's really free. No asterisk. Alright, let's close the prayer. Father, thank you so much for the study tonight. God, there's so much material, so much new information. God, help us to absorb it, Lord, and allow your Spirit to arrange it in such a way, God, that it brings clarity and brings definition and brings uh, a, a greater depth of understanding of your ministry. Father, we thank you for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to bear our sins. We thank you, Father, that he was sinless. He did not yield to temptation as we do. And, Lord, he was the satisfying sacrifice, God, for our sins. We thank you, God, for the study. We thank you for our time tonight, for your word. Bless us for the remainder of this week. In Jesus' name we pray.